Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and I believe that all readers should read children's literature, especially adults. So that's what we do on the Kid Lit Love podcast. We celebrate all things children's literature, picture books, early readers, middle grade, and young adult novels too. Whether you're an adult reading to your inner child or connecting the young readers in your lives with fantastic books, you've come to the right place. Each week, we'll talk to a different children's literature author and discuss their books, their hopes and dreams for readers, their writing process, and much, much more. So grab a notebook to build your TBR, and let's get to today's episode of Kid Lit Love. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm Stephanie, your Kid Lit Loving host, inviting you back to another weekly conversation with a children's literature author. Today, I'm talking with Benson Shum, an author and illustrator of multiple picture books you might know and love. Books like Imagine You and Me, Little Seed, First Night of Howler Garden, and Anzu the Great Kaiju. He's also a Disney animator who has worked on films that you'll likely know and love as well. Films like Moana, my personal favorite, Big Hero 6, Zootopia, and Good Old Frozen. Today, we're talking about his newest picture book released just in time to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival, Mooncake's Mean Family. Benson, welcome to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate this. Oh, the pleasure is is all mine. Um, and I'm really excited because this is a bonus summer episode. So because we are in summer reading season, which hopefully means reading more and more often, um, I've got a couple of bonus episodes releasing so that we can get kids into adults and or we can get books into adults and kids' hands throughout the summer, which means it's just in time to help you launch your newest book, Mooncakes Mean Family, which comes out tomorrow if they are listening in real time. So happy early Brooke birthday. Thank you. Thank you. So while I can't wait to talk about Mooncakes Mean Family, because I just adored the book for so many reasons, I would love for you to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your work and your books before we jump in specifically to your newest? Uh, okay. I will, well, thanks for the introduction. I think you kind of covered a lot of it, but um, I'll go in a bit more detail. But yeah, so I uh, currently live in Los Angeles, um, but I'm originally born and raised in Vancouver, BC, up in Canada. Um, and I've always like loved drawing as a kid. Um, and I love reading comic books as a kid. Um, so I actually went in the route of um, going into animation, uh, which eventually led me to work at the Walt Disney Animation Studios. Oh. Um, and from there, uh, at that time, actually, this might be going too far back. But no, love it all. The, okay. <laughs> at that time, uh, I was studying 2D animation, right? Because we grew up watching The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, and I just loved drawing. Um, and when I graduated from college through animation school, uh, there wasn't a lot of 2D animation work anymore. So I ended up working, doing some design work, which was great in TV. But eventually I went back to school to learn the 3D uh, mm -hmm. world because that was the new thing that was coming up. Um, and from there, eventually when I got into the industry working in 3D, I kind of stopped drawing, which is, which is weird. But that was just what it was. And when I discovered uh, making books, I actually went back to the tradition of drawing and painting. And that was such a nice um, thing to do to have something tangible. And yeah. it's kind of like reading a book, uh, like, you know, flipping pages and stuff like that. So it was kind of like a nice balance of working my day job doing animation in the computer and then in books where I'm working with paper and pencil. Um, so you've got old school and you've got the new stuff. You've yes. got the old yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I kind of balance both of them at the moment. And it's it's amazing to be able to even be part of this industry because um, you do, you get to kind of create your own stories and characters and you work with a very small, intimate team, which is which is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I I joke with my children often 
um, who are our te older teenagers, you have no idea what the movies were like back then. Like you can't look at a movie now and even imagine what the versions of movies are looked like. So it's it's so interesting to hear you talk about, you know, the evolution of of movies and animation and just like writing, it's a craft, it seems, that you have to stay on top of because mm -hmm. everything is constantly changing and moving and and growing. Yeah, and learning different techniques, right? Like whether you're in the you know animation industry, there's always new things to learn or new tools. And then also in books, you're experimenting with different mediums or you're writing a different type of style, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I can't wait. I'll ask that question later, but I, I'm always, I'm always fascinated by the process because I was a kid who loved to draw, but the difference between you and me is that I really could not. Yeah. <laughs> we all could draw. No I know. What, Everybody can, tells can. me that I can draw really good stick people, Benson, but, but <laughs> that is, that is about it. Um, but I, I'm always fascinated by how how illustrators bring the words to life in such a beautiful package. Picture books are some of my most favorite things. It's like little little books of magic that can be kind of given from one person to the other. So I am going to pick your brain later of exactly yeah, yeah. how, because I love that you still are kind of old fashioned. It's It's not all digital. It sounds like you are working with actual media on the mm -hmm. page, which, which I love. But we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Sure, First, sure. Yeah, to talk, about, <laughs> to talk about the book. Um, Mooncakes Mean Family, which is, oh, it's such a beautiful book. Thank it's you. a beautiful book about family and togetherness and tradition and food and just all the wonderful, beautiful things that you think of when you're just kind of wrapped in love. Um, it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. And so I'd love for you to introduce the book to listeners in your own words, what Mooncakes Mean Family is about, perhaps why um, you decided to write this book right now too. Okay, um, yeah, so Mooncake Means Family is a book that celebrates the Mid-Autumn Festival. Um, sometimes it's called the Mooncake Festival. Uh, we follow two bunny sisters, Jade and Crystal, um, as they are excited for the holiday because they get to eat their favorite dessert, which are mooncakes. Uh, for those that don't know, mooncakes, um, as a, a dessert, it's made of sweet um, lotus paste, and it was with a salted egg yolk in the center, uh, which actually represents the moon. So aside from the festival, uh, it's also about spending time with friends and family, whether they are near or far, uh, doing activities together, eating lots and lots of food. Um, so I hope kids will learn more about the festival, and on that day, maybe go out, look up to the sky, and watch the full moon together. Um, because during that time, um, it is said that that's when the moon is at its fullest and brightest. And I do remember one time I was driving home from school and you you look up and the moon just looks so big that it almost looks unreal. So it's quite magical. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I love how at the end, for those that are unfamiliar with the Mid-Autumn Festival, you, dig, you do give a little bit of the history or the backstory of the origin story of of that time. Can you talk a little bit about that for readers that might not be familiar? Yeah, so it's uh, there's this folktale that we we learned um, when we were kids and, and about uh, the moon goddess and her name is Chang E. And it's about, let's see, how can I wrap up the story? But so so, so the legend goes that um, there was this uh, archer, this brilliant archer, his name is uh, Hui. And it was when the earth was had 10 suns. So it was so hot that people couldn't bear uh, stand it. So he actually shot nine of the 10 moons. And so now we have, uh, or suns, sorry, suns. So now we have one. So then the gods were like, oh, you know, you did su such great things for the people. So we're going to reward you with an elixir of life, right? So like eternal um, eternal life. And, and he was married to Chang Er at that time, his wife, but he didn't want to leave her and become a god. Yeah. So he decided to hide it in their house. And then one day, a thief came in to break in to try to steal it. And he was out hunting or something. And so she ended up taking it so that it would prevent the thief from stealing it. And she ended up floating up to the moon uh, and became, became the moon goddess. And, you know, he missed his wife. And so every year he would create his favorite dessert, which is the mooncake. So, and from that day on, 
that's just kind of what you did as a tradition to like an offering of remembrance of of his wife. So beautiful. Yeah. So <laughs> I loved I loved reading that. I am someone who just always loves learning something new, especially if it can help me better understand others and the world and how it works and how we can appreciate it. And so mm -hmm. that that piece at the end just was it it topped off the beautiful story with this beautiful backstory that just made me appreciate it so much more. And, and I know I put you on the spot for a quick <laughs> of it, but no. that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful capturing of it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think learning, like you said, like learning about um folk tales or legends from different cultures it's fascinating because it talks about you know how, the thought process too right yes. you know it's yeah I, I love learning uh, different cultures of their legends and um, little stories and stuff like that so the creativity in it so yeah and and your book just does it in such an inviting and relatable way I mean, they're bunnies. What's not to love, you know, <laughs> about uh, about that? I think in doing that, kids, readers, adults, anybody, um, you can see yourself on the page. Whether mm -hmm. you're actually celebrating that particular, um, you know, mid-autumn festival or not, we all do have some sort of root tradition or root something in in our own families and and cultures that are all worth celebrating. And so I think your book does two things. One, it can introduce readers to this particular festival and celebration and all the, the beautiful, is beautifulness a word? The beautifulness <laughs> I was going to say. Sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll just go with it. But then also, I think as a reader, you can't help but just get that warm, fuzzy feeling mm. inside and think about where, where does my family do this? How does my family do this? Um, and so you you get the best of of both worlds i think when when yeah. you yeah well thank you for saying that I, I really appreciate that and and also i chose bunnies also as um because there's actually another legend that i'm not too familiar with but it's about the jade rabbit so i thought oh a bunny a rabbit and because i think uh in the other story changa has a friend or a jade rabbit that's with her so they say if you look closely you might see her and also a jade rabbit with her on the moon so I thought maybe a bunny would kind of fun thing to add in there as a family. So <laughs> oh, I love that. See, this is why I love to get to pick the brains of the author and illustrator, because now it just it it means it means so much more now thinking, <laughs> thinking about that. Now in in the story, um, grandma and grandpa come mm -hmm. and it's it's a beautiful family celebration, and they say happy mid-autumn festival. And I would I would love for you to actually say it the way that grandma and grandpa said it so that I can get the the full beauty of that phrase. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I hope I don't mispronounce it, but I think- well, you'll be better uh, than I would do yeah. <laughs> for listeners, so. <laughs> uh, I think it's Zhong Chao Jie Kuai Le. So that means um, Happy Mid Autumn Festival. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. You did a, a much more beautiful job than I, I think I would have done with that. <laughs> But that's always a fun thing to do during school, like school visits, also to kind of like um, have the kids say it with you and stuff like that. And they're learning something new. And I've, I've done that with my previous book, Alex's Good Fortune, where I had that one celebrating the Lunar New Year. And I would have little greetings that you say during that time. And I think that was a fun thing to do with the kids. Yeah, it just helps you to embody it a, mm -hmm. a little bit more, to appreciate it, to celebrate it, to acknowledge it. Um, you know, that's what books. I think can do so well is to just put us in the shoes of another character or situation or whatever that we might not be able to do in real life as well. And it just, it, it, it adds to us. I think it just makes us better for, for that yeah. experience. Totally. Totally. Now I don't like to give spoilers, but I do have to tell you my favorite line. And so listeners haven't read this, then they're, they're going to know, one of one of the lines. This one just just went right to my heart, um, and it is towards the end. Um, I'm still not spoiling the the end, but <laughs> the line that I I love that just made me stop and kind of catch my breath a little bit was this: Jade smiles, knowing her family away is looking at the same moon. 
you had me there, Benson. I thought, oh my gosh, this book is so much more than celebration and tradition and food. It is the connection that we have with others, whether they are here or not. Mm -hmm. This, this is what binds us together. Like, oh, I just, it was, it was a goosebumpy moment at the end of your book. And so I just had Thank to take you. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But it's really like, you know, anytime we look up the sky, we're looking at the same thing. You yes. know, it's really about togetherness and community. And yeah, no matter where you are, it's, we, we can have our thoughts on each other, you know? Yeah. yeah. It was such a beautiful reminder of that. It was, it was, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's talk about the illustrations because I'm lucky enough that you have done both. So I can talk to you about the story and then I can pick your brain a little bit about the, the illustrations. I love how they are outlined in, in, in a black color. And then you just have this bright yet saturated, like you just have them these beautiful color within. It's just so bright and in, inviting. And now I know that you do it old school by mm -hmm. hand. And so I'd love for you to talk about how, how do you go about taking a story with such a beautiful message like this and actually representing it in an illustration for readers? What, what is your process for that? Um, so I, so I tend to draw very, um, very rough, like very sketchy. Um, so I, I do start on paper and pen, pen first. So I do all my sketches on paper. And then uh, when I have it, to a certain point where I think, oh, I think there's something there. Um, I scan it into the computer and then I start to refine the sketches. Um, but then once, you know, we make like a dummy to send to the editor and everything. And when they approve that, then I will start to paint it traditionally. So I what I do is I I print out the sketches and then I use like a light box and then I start to ink on watercolor paper. Um, and then once that's done, then I'll paint on top of it and then scan that into the computer and then maybe do a few little touch-ups and send that over to the that's like the general process yeah. um but I actually tend to paint quite small um so sometimes I paint almost two sides but usually I paint quite small and I'll show you an example of you know you really can't see it but this is like oh one of the oh yeah what? that is small wow yeah yeah so it's like one of the first painting I did actually that inspired the book um, was I did this painting during the mid autumn festival like a couple of years before the book, the book came out. And uh, I really just want to, because I love mooncakes, my sisters and I love mooncakes. And uh, I remember going to like Chinatown and they would have different types of shapes. Like usually, the, you know, we would always go for, towards the animals because like that's like a little pig and a basket kind of thing. And I just wanted to do a painting about that. Um, and when I did this painting, um, that actually sparked my agent to be like, oh, is there, maybe there's something there. Yeah. Um, and then we would pitch this idea to my editor that I had on Alex's Fortune. And um, that's kind of how the book kind of came about. I think I might've went on a different tangent. No, but I love that. If you ask any questions about the process, I love tangents. I love them. <laughs> now I have something else that I that I want to talk about. But um, I I love just learning. You you kind of go old school, new school, old school. Like you you're using the the tools back and forth. So and you mentioned watercolor paper. Is it mm -hmm. all watercolor or primarily? I guess watercolor. Uh, it's all watercolor. Yeah, it, watercolor yeah. ink. So the ink I use like an India ink, which is like a um waterproof ink. Um, and that way, when I paint on top of it, it doesn't bleed. Um, but th those are the, yeah, it's very simple tools. This is watercolor ink. I use arches, uh, watercolor paper, and that's it. And then I just scan it in. Oh, well, once I paint it, then I scan it in. Uh, but yeah, very minimal tools. Yeah. Writing down that kind of paper that you just said. I am a notebook hoarder. I love paper. Oh, okay. And yeah. I recently started... I hesitate to, to talk to you about my watercoloring, but I have started just, oh. just goofing around, you know, yes. with watercolor. There's something so soothing about not even making something, but just brushing that brush across the paper at the different intensity or the different pressure and, and seeing what mm -hmm. happens. So maybe if I get your paper, it'll come out looking a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I'm always experimenting with different papers as well because I find, so I use the uh, Arches 300 um, 
LBS or something, um, 300 pound one. And that one is cold pressed. So that has a bit of a tooth to it. So there's a bit of like friction. Um, yeah. And then and then there's also a hot press, which is completely smooth. Uh, I've tried the smooth one. It doesn't really quite work for me, but I have friends that love the hot press, the smooth paper. So, so it's kind of fun to see because the paint flows differently as well. Depending on what type of paper you use, and yeah, and yeah, it's it's really fun to experiment. I had no idea. I now I now have to go look at my paper, and see <laughs> what it is. Maybe maybe I would like, and the outcome might look a tiny bit better on the other one. But <laughs> but in all honesty, for me, the watercoloring is just it's therapeutic. It's so mm -hmm. therapeutic, and then to see someone who can actually do something with it, like I I just so admire the talent and the ability that you have to, to bring the stories to life. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. The book is gorgeous. I wish people could see it. You. you know, it's a podcast, so they're listening. <laughs> um, but if, you know, if they take anything away, it's number one, it's a beautiful story. And number two, it's just beautiful to look at Thank you. as well. It's, it's so nice. Now, in thinking of this book and then knowing you have written other picture books um, as well, and certainly probably in your your other animation work, um, what is your hope for for readers who might pick up this book or might pick up any of your previous books in your, in your backlist as well? Do you have a, a hope or something in mind when you just put that book from your hands and put it into someone else's? Um, yeah, I don't. Don't necessarily think about that, but the things my friends do say that, or people that read book, they see a pattern, so it's probably there just subconsciously. Yeah. But um, I think a lot of my books kind of tend to talk about um kindness, mm -hmm. and and um, you know, the helping each other and being together and um, oh, what was I just gonna say? It's it's like I also kind of like want to give kids or adults the opportunity to be seen you know whether that's visually or emotionally I do tend to write in from an emotional standpoint of like uh, sometimes people that feel a certain way are not seen or at least generally seen by people you know and I kind of want to give that those people a voice including myself you know yeah. um and I think that's that's so important um that sometimes the loudest voice in the room gets all the attention and I want to give the people that you know tend to be a bit more quiet and they can be just as strong and just as important and I want to give a voice to that or at least so that they can they know that yeah. you know we're, we're we're here we're not alone you know right and that's tend to be the themes generally of, of my books so yeah that's beautiful and as a, a fellow I may be a podcaster but I am quite the introvert when I am not on the podcast and so I I can really appreciate that. That's what books do for me mm. um, as well. They, you know, they help us feel seen and then they also help us see, you know, some, yes. something else too. And I, I love how you talked about that emotional aspect because that is probably why I felt that emotional reaction to your book as well, because you're putting it in and the reader just feels it and gets a sense of that. Mm. Um, and, and that's, that's a special thing when that happens in, in a book. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear you talk about that and that, you know, others are, are talking about that too. They also mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And you mentioned getting the idea for this book, Mooncakes Mean Family, um, during a previous um, festival and doing that quit sketch. Do the other books come to you like that as well? Is it just kind of an idea that drops in and you either sit on it for a while or tinker with it? How, yeah. how does that happen for you? Yeah, so um, it's, it's, you know, it's different for every book. Some books came out with a painting first and some of them didn't. So uh, so for example, like Imagine You and Me, um, which came out uh, this, this year in January, that one actually started with painting first as well. And then I created a story around that painting. Um, and from there, I'll start to develop, I start to ask questions about the painting. Because usually when I'm painting something or creating a, an image, um, I try to put them in a situation and maybe a little bit of, of, of what are they doing kind of thing. And then I'll create it because I try to give mo emotion into or emotions into the painting. 
Um, and then I started to ask, where are they going? You know, how do they know each other? And then those kind of questions lead to a, a possible story. Um, and then sometimes it just starts with a spark, so of an idea. So with that one would be like uh, Anzu the Great Kaiju. That one started with just the concept of I love kaijus. So for those that don't know, a kaiju is like a, a giant monsters in Japanese. So like Godzilla is a kaiju, King Kong is a kaiju. And that one just came of the idea of like, what if we we spin spun it and and we know that they destroy things, destroy cities. But what if this kaiju doesn't want to destroy and wants to bring joy rather than destruction? And from there, I start to explore what kind of superpowers they have. And and that was just so much fun. So yeah. and that so that one came with the story first and then the drawings came after. Yeah. So yeah, it depends. I don't know. Sometimes it depends. I don't know where the stories come from. They just kind of come. Yeah. And that's wherever okay. the process. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay. We are we are grateful when all of them come that way. Which leads me to my next question then is what are you working on now? Anything we can expect in the future that you can tell us about? Uh yeah. So um I have another book coming out in December. Um, that one is very sim a similar format to um, Mooncake's Mean Family. Um, and this one is about uh, line dancing. So it's called We Are Line Dancers. And for those not familiar with line dancing, um, it is when you go to the uh, Lunar New Year and you see, you hear the drums and the firecrackers and you see a lion, which is uh, two people. So one person that has a head, shakes the head and one person the bottom, so, so the butt area that bounces his butt. And so that that performance, that dance is called uh, line dancing. And and that book uh, is it's talking about different types of line dances, right? Because there's some of them that look like what we usually see in um, the Lunar Year Parade. And some of them are have a different design. So I'll talk a bit about that and their traditions. Um, and then that book kind of came about because I used to do line dancing as uh, when I was younger and that's yeah. part of the uh, Kung Fu club that I, that I was part of and then they did line dancing would perform you know we talk about performing at wedding ceremonies or at the parades restaurant openings um, business openings so all that kind of stuff and, and you know aside from the actual performance of it it is really about teamwork and working together and coordination because it can be quite acrobatic as well um, and I always remember that feeling of like because I would always be, because I'm a little taller, I always would be the butt. So I would be lifting the other person up to, wow. to stand on my leg, like me, so that we're higher up to, to get like the lettuce, you know, the red envelope lettuce. So it's always like the timing and and making sure that he doesn't, he or she doesn't fall when I'm lifting them up and stuff like that. So wow. I'm, I'm getting way too much detail. But, no, you're um, not. I love it. This is this is exactly the kind of stuff I love to know about the book. So it's wonderful. You're just getting everybody excited for it in December. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, so I'm very excited about that book as well. Um, and it's a little bit of me uh, in the book. So um, yeah, so hope, you know, you guys will enjoy that when it comes out. Oh, I love that. I love it. I will, I will get my hands on that one too, because it sounds like I will, I will love it as much as I did Mooncake's Mean Family, because it has some similar threads and and vibes about learning something new, getting a better appreciation for mm -hmm. it. Um, and I mean, what's more fun than learning about how, how that beautiful dance works. So that's yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Now, did that one come to you as a painting? Or an idea? That one came to me as an idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today and talking to us about your books, both your backlist, your current brand new tomorrow book that's coming out and the one that's coming in the future. If listeners want to find out more about you, where is the best place to find you online? Um, yeah, so uh, my website is uh, www.bensonshum.com. Uh, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, which is X. And uh, so that's at bshum79. Um, and I'm also on TikTok as well with the same tag at, at bshum79. Okay. I'll be sure to put links to your website, your social media handles, and all the books that we have mentioned today in the show notes so that listeners can can get their hands on them. Thank you so much. I oh, think, thank welcome. you for having me on your show. It's, this is really wonderful. Oh, 
I loved it. Thank you. And, and listeners, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Kid Let Love podcast. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Kid Lit Love podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to listen to my other podcast called Get Literate. It's a podcast that explores all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to build a life you love. One more thing. If you love what you listened to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a bookish friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish community of kid lit love. Thanks for listening.